Well, good morning. Please pass your cards inside out. They'll be picked up at this time. If you have your Bibles, you may be turning to Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2. And let's get into today's lesson. The writer of this book says, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Now, I want you to notice the message that's being said here and why it's being said. The message is very simplistic, obviously, all of us understand that, hopefully, that uh, the reason he is saying this is because some were drifting away, some weren't paying that close attention. And the problem with that is that he knew what the result would be. He says, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, watch what he says next, He says, how shall we escape? Now notice, if we neglect. Now the idea of neglecting goes along with passages such as Hebrews 10 and verse 25, where people were were forsaking the assembly. And in verse 26 says, if we go on sinning willfully, it was a decision that they made. To neglect or to forsake is something that is the conclusion is that the conclusion of what we have thought about, what we have thought to do. He says, how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to by those who heard. Now you see, today, we, we look at this, we say, how does this apply to our lives? Well, it applies basically because we can still drift away from the, the message of the truth. It applies because we too must pay closer attention to what we have heard. Why is that? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the what? By the Word of God. So if faith comes by hearing, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, thus to develop our faith. Not paying attention means our faith is going to be lacking. I remember years ago watching someone known as uh, Houdini, and there really should be two things here. I didn't make that distinction. But you know, I remember one time he was put in a straight jacket and, and shackled all up and, and lifted upside down you know, between heaven and earth. And he was suspended. And he had a certain amount of time and he got out of that straight jacket. I remember another time there he was lowered into a, a, a trunk. And when he's put into the trunk, if you remember correctly, if you've seen the, the footage, uh, the, the trunk is closed. It is latched. There's a chain that's put around the trunk, a lock on the chain. He's thrown into the ocean, and somehow, miraculously, he escapes. Of course, all that is trickery. And unlike Houdini, you know, whenever he would use trickery to get out of his stuff, when it comes to our sin problem, there is no magic we can use. Now, this is important to us because of the very basic fact. Do we remember what Jesus said Whenever Jesus was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, tucked away in Matthew 22 and verse 33 is a very important verse for us. Uh, 23, 33. He said, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Brother Jack, you can't preach that today. That's too harsh. You're going to offend somebody. Don't talk about hell and don't talk about sentencing. Well, that's being judgmental. If you said anyone was in sin today, you know, that's just not appropriate, and you may have to be sent to tolerance classes. Boy, I like that. You need to be more tolerant of sin. No, being tolerant of sin is why we are where we are now, amen? Amen. That's how our, our country got in the shape that it's in now. So we look at this. Jesus is asking a very, very important question right to the point. He said, I'm not going to mince any words. Here we go. You ready for this? How are you going to escape hell? How are you going to do it? You are right here. If you remain scribes and Pharisees and of the Jewish faith, you will not escape hell. That's what he was saying. Why? Because there's going to to be a recognition of who Christ was, what he was all about. And there were no magic tricks that could be used here either, only obedience. Now we're going to have to see that today. 
And I want to hope, hopefully bring some things, make some things abundantly clear today that maybe, you know, before we read them, we go, okay, I understand all there is to know about that. But whenever you delve into it and get down deeply into it, you find out other things. So here we go. To tell someone they needed to escape would be a moot point unless something or someone had them bound. There would be no reason at all for Jesus Christ to look at somebody and to say to them, how are you going to escape hell? Unless somehow, by something or someone, they were bound. Why all the warnings to us? Why in Hebrews chapter 2 does it talk to us about neglecting such a great salvation unless it's possible for us to neglect a great salvation? Amen? So we look at this and we see exactly what's being said and why it's being said. And, you know, as we study the Word of God, in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch needed to escape his sin problem and Philip tells him how it could be done. Now, this is a, a, a story that's familiar to all of us. But when we look at it more closely, I think some things come to light. Philip's teaching or preaching came by way of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You look at Acts 8, about verse 29, you see the Holy Spirit was talking to Philip. And so through the inspired word, he says, I want you to go attach yourself to this eunuch. He's on a journey. And when you do this, I want you to tell him how to escape. Now, those words aren't, it's implied. It's not literally there, but it's implied. The eunuch believed what Philip preached. And as a result of that, he wanted to be saved from his sins. Now, all of us know that. and We've heard this story for years and years and years. But when you get into it and look more deeply, you find and see what happens as the eunuch and Philip come up on water. Now, I want you to notice this. The eunuch decides about salvation. Now, as we read this, you know, I want you to watch for something and see if you pick up on it here. Watch this. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. I believe the eunuch was studying and reading Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy about Christ. And Philip starts where he was. That's a very important factor. He started where the person was, started teaching him about, about Jesus. And so he taught him about the good news about Jesus. Hold on to the idea there about good news. What made the good news new, uh, good? It was because he's telling him about how his sins can be eradicated, how his sins can be forgiven, removed, taken away. Now watch carefully. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, did you get it? You see what happened here? Let's shed some light. Watch this. Did you notice that it was the eunuch that pointed out the water, not Philip? Hello? Maybe you thought all along, well, man, they were going along, and Philip said, here's water. What hinders you from being baptized? But somewhere along the line, what this means to us this means that, that somewhere in the telling of the good news, Philip had to have mentioned baptism and what it meant. Talk to him and preach to him about the good news and, and what it was all about. And somewhere along the way, Philip got the message and got the idea. So they come up on water, and Philip says, Philip's the one that brought it up. Not Philip, but the eunuch's the one that brought it up. The eunuch said, what hinders me from being baptized? He didn't have to explain how to do it since the very word baptism meant to dip, immerse, plunge, or to overwhelm. Now, I want, to, I want to get more deeply involved in this in just a second, but I find it fascinating that in telling the eunuch how to escape his sin problem, that's what this was all about. Matter of fact, it had far-reaching ramifications. Why was it so important? Because Philip preaching to the eunuch Someone that had a little bit of, a, of sway, if you will. Preaching to him, he's going back to Ethiopia. Going back to Africa. Going back to spread the gospel to the entire world. So it's, it's imperative that he gets this message right. And so he would understand here, and I'll go more on this in a second, but he would certainly understand here when we're talking about this, when he said baptism, that he did not mean to pour, that's the word keo, 
He did not mean to sprinkle, rantizo, that's the word for that. The baptism meant to dip, immerse, plunge, or overwhelm. He absolutely would know this because that's what the word meant. So there wasn't any argument. It's only whenever we get to our time or hundreds of years later after this that people have a problem with the idea of what baptism meant. If you go back to the original, that's exactly what it meant. Now I want you to notice also that before baptism or anything else was done, the eunuch made a confession about Jesus. Some translations don't have this. A lot of them do. I know the ESV does. I believe this was done. And, uh, and Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I want you to notice something here. In the good news, something was taught about Jesus Christ. Something was taught about making a confession, or else that would not be there. Everybody get that? Something was taught about baptism, or else it would not be there. So part of the good news about Jesus Christ, and contacting that blood, that blood which 1 Peter 1.17 says is precious blood, that blood where the Word of God tells us, bought the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. The blood that redeems us from our sins, Ephesians 1 and verse 7. The blood that without the shedding of the blood there is no forgiveness of sins, Hebrews 9 and verse 22. That blood wherein in Romans 1, or Revelation 1, 5, Revelation 7, 14, it talks about how they had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. Church, I'm telling you, that the good news that was preached to him, starting where he was about salvation, involved confession and baptism. Now I want you to notice, he says, this has to be done before baptism's ever going to be effective. He said, it's not just a token gesture where you're going to think to yourself, well, okay, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. He said, I want you to believe it. Notice how he says, he qualifies it, with all your heart. Now there's something interesting here. I want you to consider this. Here are two men on the road to Gaza. It's a desert road. Now, when you look at that, and put your thinking caps on, Ethiopia was approximately 1,580 miles away from Jerusalem where the eunuch had just visited. Okay? You got this? They're on the road to Gaza. It's a desert road. Jerusalem to where this... Ethiopian eunuch lived 1,580 miles. I don't know about you, but that's a journey, right? Especially if you don't have a new pickup truck. I can't imagine riding on the latest Lamborghini Camel. Can you? Here we go, almost 1,600 miles. Wagon or walking, however they would get there. You realize the eunuch is now making the long journey home do you think he might have been carrying drinking water with him? Hello? You ever think about that? 1,600 mile trip. The eunuch probably had people uh, surrounding him. He's probably in a, in, a, in a party. Some scholars believe that. In a party of people. Uh, he may have been the leader of that party. I don't know. But here they are. They may have had animals. Uh, uh, you just don't know what's going on here. But do you think somebody's going to trek across desert land without having drinking water with them? Listen to Brother Jack, what are you trying to say? Well, I'll get to that in just a second. Even if the eunuch could travel 25 miles a day, it would take him 63 days to get back home in Ethiopia. 63 days. So all of us, if we're going to go on a journey in the desert, we're going to be walking, riding a camel, whatever we're doing, and we're going 63 days, we're not going to take any water with us, right? Of course he is. What's the point? The point is that whatever Philip told the eunuch about baptism, this is proof positive that it didn't involve sprinkling or pouring. Why is that? Well, sprinkling could have been done with the water he had without going into the water with Philip. If he had water right there already with him and sprinkling was the idea, why not just go there and say, this is it? Why would you have to stop and go down into the water? Now you think about it for just a second. I'll tell you why. Because he knew, because he understood the language that he was not commanded in that good news to be sprinkled. 
He was not commanded in that good news to have water poured upon him. What did he say? He came to water and he says, then this is not Philip saying it. This is the eunuch, understand that, understanding what Philip had taught him. And he says, what hinders me from being immersed into that water? That's what he's saying. Church, there's just so much in Scripture. Watch this. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. That seems like quite a bit of water to me. Philip and the eunuch, and he immersed him, baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. The Word of God is so, so very powerful, church. When we get into it and just look at its truths and just be obedient to what it has to say without man's opinions, or as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, we studied in class, about getting involved in human wisdom. Paul said, I didn't come to you with with great speech. I didn't come to you preaching human wisdom. I came to you only wanting to know Christ and Him crucified. He said, I know this. We we can listen to all this we want to. We studied in class about Galatians chapter uh, chapter 1, verses 6 down through about verse 12. And Paul's writing to the church at Galatia, Galatians 3 and verse 1. He says, who has bewitched you? The literal meaning there, who has given you the evil eye? Who has knocked you off course? And Paul's saying there, and boy, you talk about getting to the nitty gritty. Paul's saying there, he says, I am shocked, I am amazed that you are so quickly removed from the gospel that I preach to you and you have attached yourself to a different gospel which really isn't a gospel at all. And Paul says, Church of Galatia, you better understand this. Neither I nor anyone else nor an angel from heaven has any power or authority to change the Word of God from what it is to this. He says, now watch. He says, this is the gospel. He said, you've been removed from the gospel to another gospel. I asked class this morning. I said, okay. If you have the gospel, how many gospels do you have? One. If you have another gospel, how many do you have? Two. What's he saying here? He says there's one gospel. And so as we look at that, that's exactly what's what's being said here. The eunuch saw him no more, went on his way. Somewhere in that good news, it involved that we cannot deny. To deny that is to believe a falsehood. Right? That's book, chapter, and verse. Genesis chapter 7. Let me give you another example here. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Church, hold on to that. Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came upon the earth. 600. (laughs) I like that, don't you? 600 years old. I want to know, of course, retirement age back then would be 900, you know. Well, Well, don't get me started on that anyway. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Now I want you to notice what takes place here. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, that means represented on the earth, male and female, went in as God had commanded him. There you have that idea again. Obedience to God. Watch. And the Lord shut him in. Now I want you to notice something about this. Again, the escape of Noah and his family was about obedience, just like it is now. People get all up in the air. You mean I have to do something to be saved? If I have to do something to be saved, I don't want to do it. I can't believe a a God of grace and all this would have me do anything to be saved. I just can't believe. You know, we want to talk for God, and that's the problem today. Here is problem number one. God created us. And I've told you this many, many times. You get around people and they say, that's just the way I am. Well, that's a falsehood also because God is the only I am. We're created to become. And the other thing about that is that's so important. Where we've gotten in trouble is instead of allowing God to create in us like David prayed about in Psalm 51, creating me a pure heart, O God, instead of allowing God to create in us through His Word, we try to create our own God. 
Oh, we want a God that's, that's resilient. We want a God that's, that, that fits our, our needs. We want a God that's, that, that's, that doesn't condemn us. We want a God that does it. See, just this past week, and I'm going to say this, and it may, I'm just going to come out and say it because I was astonished. This past week, you have the, the Pope making a statement, you know, ask about the gay situation, and he skirted the issue. Wasn't that nice? And he makes a statement something like this, well, who am I to judge? Let me tell you who you are. You've told the world for generations, ever since the Catholic Church began, that a Pope is infallible. That means he can't make any mistakes concerning faith and morals. Now tell me about it. Don't shirk the issue. Don't sidestep the issue. Have gumption, have gall, and tell the world, because after all, you can't make a mistake, right? So, you know, it just, I think that's what we're talking about. The idea, and Paul is saying, and you know, all the rest of them, I'm not going to be wishy-washy about this. And he goes on to say this. I have always thought God shut the door for two reasons at the ark. Because those in the water were Noah's relatives. That's a give me. Everyone in there is related. Just like we are. We get all caught up in our world. And church, I want you to think about this deeply and think about it long. We get all caught up in the world about people and, and you know, their, uh, their nationality, their color and all of this. When in reality, through Adam, later through Noah, we're all related. Now you may not like that. Brother Jack, did you not read the news today and there's 21, 22 different embassies of America that they closed down now and taking people back. There's a warning because of their terrorist attack. That is very sad. I don't like it. But the reality of it is we're all related somehow, some way. Isn't that true? And so as you look at all of this, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that justice is not being done. Everybody understand? It doesn't mean that God's not going to have his way because he is. Because those in the water were Noah's relatives. And secondly, God wanted to relieve Noah of this difficult responsibility. How many, how many of us, I had one person say, well, he couldn't have shut the door anyway. He's 600 years old. Oh, forget it. He built the ark, you know. So I believe that's what's going on here, is this idea. And we're back to the idea of obedience and being obedient to God. I want to close with this part of Scripture Right here, and let you go a little early today. Maybe. Maybe not. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach. Teach what? Church, teach what? Teach the truth. Teach the gospel. Be like Philip going to the eunuch. Patiently enduring evil. What does that mean? That means your life and my life is going to be affected by the power of Satan. Because 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 says, After all, he is the God of this world or God of this age. We're going to be affected by him. He's going to do his best to do whatever he can do. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape, now watch, and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now this is not about demon possession. This is about people falling into the, the temptations. James 1 and verse 13, God tempts no man. It means that we are tempted, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Temptations are given, but not beyond what we can't handle, what we can't say no to. So how do we escape? And church, I suggest to all of us that if we as a people do the same thing in the 21st century as they did in the first century for salvation, our sins will be forgiven too. You see, therein lies the great truth that people fail to see in many cases. That it's not about pomp and circumstance. It's not about fads and gimmicks. It's not about, you know, and whenever I tell people this, and I'm preaching at meetings or wherever I, I am, and I, I tell people, say, listen, God didn't call us through the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, to be saved people 
in order to build a, a large edifice or in order to build a large crowd. Now, don't misunderstand me. That could be the result, and it should be the result, of people yearning for the truth. But we should never be sidetracked into building a large congregation of people by letting the truth of the Word of God go away. And so through obedience is what the Word of God is telling us. Through this obedience to the Word of God, we're going to be what God would have us to be. And whether you're talking about Noah or you're talking about the Ethiopian eunuch or you're talking about us, how are we going to escape such a great salvation if we neglect such a great salvation? To neglect means to willfully do something. To forsake means to willfully do something. And church, the Word of God tells us in Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24, unless you believe that I am He, you're going to die in your sins. I didn't say that. I didn't invent that. To die from the word thanatos means to be separated. Jesus said, and Isaiah 59, 1 and verse 2, says your sin separates you from God. So Jesus was saying, unless you believe that I am He, you're going to be separated from God. Why? Because of a sin problem. And you neglected the salvation. Jesus said, Luke 13 and verse 3, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Perish is not a good thing, church. Hello? And then Jesus said, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Whoever confesses me before man, I'll confess before my Father. Whoever denies me before man, I will deny before my Father. Romans 10 and verse 10, With the mouth confession is made unto or toward salvation. 1 Peter 3, 21, Baptism is also now save us. He that believeth and is baptized, Mark 16 and verse 16, shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. We go on and on and on with Scripture. Then we're told, 1 John 2 and verse 6, you say you abide in Him, you ought to walk as He walked. So we have all these things that are there telling us with certainty. 1 John 5 and verse 13, these things are written to you who believe that you may watch, know that you have salvation. Amen. How are we going to escape? Same thing they did in the first century. Same thing that needs to be done today. If you have a need, won't you come as we stand and sing?